Continuing on with the urinary system, and in this lecture, we will cover renal physiology. We will describe the three basic processes undertaken by nephrons and collecting ducts to produce urine. We will discuss how this process differs depending on whether we need to produce dilute or concentrated urine. We will discuss the impact of these horm of hormones on these processes, as well as the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. And lastly, we will discuss the composition, storage and elimination of urine. So getting straight into it, learning objective number one, to describe glomerular filtration. So to produce urine, nephrons and collecting ducts perform three basic processes. These are glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Glomerular filtration is the first step. This is where water and most, sol most solutes in the blood plasma move across the wall of the glomerular capillaries, where they're filtered through the glomerular filtration membrane and move into the Bowman's capsule and then into the tubules. Tubular reabsorption occurs as this filtered fluid goes through the renal tubules and the collecting ducts and the tubule cells reabsorb most of the water and any of the solutes that the body needs back into the blood. Now here, just take note that this term is tubular reabsorption and refers to the return of substances back to the bloodstream. So this is different to the entry of new substances into the body, so absorption, like what occurs in the gastrointestinal tract. Tubular secretion then also occurs as our filtered fluid goes through the renal tubules and our collecting ducts. And the cells in these regions secrete materials such as waste products, drugs and excess ions into the filtered fluid, thereby removing it from the blood. So in the next few learning objectives, we we're going to describe each of these processes in more details, but I just wanted to give you an overview first. And if you can at least understand this, then that's great. But the function of our kidneys is to filter our blood. The waste or any unwanted products that are filtered out of the blood are then excreted from the body as urine. So if the blood flow to our kidneys is reduced and no blood is being filtered, no urine will be produced and no waste will be excreted. So the first step in urine formation is our glomerular filtration. So glomerular filtration, as the name suggests, occurs in the glomerulus and very generally is the process of blood being filtered through the filtration membrane so that most of the blood plasma ends up in the Bowman's capsule with essentially only the blood cells, the platelets and the large plasma proteins being left behind in the bloodstream. So looking at that process, we have blood entering the glomerulus through our afferent arteriole. It moves into the glomerulus, which remember was that ball or cluster of capillaries that sits within the Bowman's or the glomerular capsule. The blood, the blood, sorry, is filtered through that filtration membrane. What remains in the bloodstream, so mainly just our blood cells, our platelets and our large proteins, then exit the glomerulus through our efferent arteriole. What's passed through that filtration membrane ends up in the Bowman's capsule. This is now called filtrate and this filtrate then moves through into our proximal convoluted tubule. Now this process of glomerular filtration depends on three main pressures. One pressure promotes filtration and two pressures oppose filtration. So the first pressure that we have is our glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. This is the pressure of the blood in the glomerular capillaries. Generally, this pressure is about 55 millimeters of mercury and it promotes filtration by forcing the water and the solutes in blood plasma through this filtration membrane. So we have blood coming in through our afferent arteriole. The pressure of the blood in these capillaries here forces the water and solutes through this filtration membrane into the Bowman's capsule. 
We then have our capsular hydrostatic pressure. So this is the pressure exerted against the filtration membrane by fluid already in that capsular space and the renal tubule. This capsular hydrostatic pressure opposes filtration and represents a back pressure or an opposing pressure of 15 millimetres of mercury. So if you think we've got our blood coming through here and filtering substances through that filtration membrane, we're already going to have some filtrate here in the Bowman's capsule and our renal tubules. The pressure that that filtrate already in the capsule opposes back against our glomerulus is our capsular hydrostatic pressure. The third pressure is our blood colloid osmotic pressure. So this is the pressure caused by the presence of large proteins in blood plasma, which are kept within the glomerulus, and they act to draw water back into the blood, pre uh, into the blood vessels. Because this pressure draws water back into the glomerulus, it opposes filtration, and the average blood colloid osmotic pressure is 30 millimetres of mercury. So this one is the, the proteins that are sitting still within this glomerulus. They act to draw water out of the filtrate back in to the blood in the glomerulus. It opposes filtration. So we then sum these three pressures to determine our net filtration pressure. We take the pressure that promotes filtration and, and uh, subtract the two that oppose filtration. If we sum all of those values, we typically get a value of 10 millimetres of mercury. This is a positive number, so it means that filtration will occur. If this number was negative, or if it was zero, it would mean that there's a stronger pressure to draw water and solutes back into the glomerulus, rather than filter substances out of it. So recapping those three pressures for you, we have our glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. That was the pressure of the blood inside the glomerular capillaries. It promotes filtration by pushing the water and the solutes through that filtration membrane. We have the capsular hydrostatic pressure. So this is the pressure back against the filtration membrane by the filtrate or the fluid that's already stored in the Bowman's capsule. And then we have our blood colloid osmotic pressure, which is the pressure exerted by the proteins within the glomerulus, which act to draw fluid back into the capillaries. So this also opposes our filtration. By summing those one positive and two negative values, we get our net filtration pressure. So we have our glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure minus our capsular hydrostatic pressure minus our blood colloid osmotic pressure. If this net filtration pressure is positive, it means that filtration will occur. If net filtration pressure is zero or negative, no blood will be filtered and no urine will be produced. So we've just talked about net filtration pressure and that influences glomerular filtration rate. So glomerular filtration rate is the amount of filtrate that is formed in all of the renal corpuscles, so all of our Bowman's capsules, in both of our kidneys every single minute. In adults, the glomerular filtration rate, or the, the GFR, is uh, 125 millilitres per minute in males on average and 105 millilitres per minute in females. The greater filtration rate in males simply due to their larger blood volume, so a larger amount of blood is actually going to the kidneys to, being, to be filtered. Now, it's really important for the homeostasis of our body fluids that we maintain a relatively consistent glomerular filtration rate. If glomerular filtration rate is too high, needed substances may pass too quickly through the renal tubules for, for us to actually reabsorb it and put it back into the blood. And so at risk of things like increased urine output, leading to dehydration and electrolyte depletion. 
if our glomerular filtration rate is too low, everything within the filtrate may be reabsorbed and the waste products that we actually wanted to get rid of will not be adequately excreted. Now, as I said, our glomerular filtration rate is directly related to the pressures that we just spoke about. And therefore, any changes in each of those three pressures or our net filtration pressure is going to affect our glomerular filtration rate. However, our body has three general mechanisms that we can use to keep this rate consistent. These are renal autoregulation, neural regulation, and hormonal regulation. So starting with renal autoregulation, and this is the kidneys regulating themselves. So renal relating to the kidneys, auto talking about itself and regulation. So the way that the kidneys do this is by regulating the flow of blood into the glomerulus. And it does this when we have everyday normal fluctuations in systemic blood pressure. So for example, you've just woken up, you've been lying down, you stand up, your blood pressure is going to drop. Just for a couple of seconds, renal autoregulation, which is going to account for that to maintain our glomerular filtration rate. Now, within renal autoregulation, there are two ways that we can regulate this filtration rate. We're going to talk about them more on the next few slides, but very briefly, we have the myogenic mechanism. So this relates to the stretching and then subsequent constriction of the afferent arteriole. And then we have tubuloglomerular uh, feedback, sorry, horrible word to say, which, as the name suggests, is obtained, is feedback obtained about the composition of the filtrate within the tubules. So the myogenic mechanism occurs when stretching triggers contraction or constriction of smooth muscle cells in the walls of the afferent arterioles. So as systemic blood pressure rises, our glomerular filtration rate will also rise because blood flow to the kidneys and the glomerulus will increase, as does the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. So when this happens, the elevated blood pressure and the increased blood flow through that afferent arteriole will stretch the walls of the arteriole and in response, the smooth muscle fibres will constrict, narrowing this lumen or the opening of the afferent arteriole, reducing the blood flow into the glomerulus and therefore reducing this glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. With reduced glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, we have a reduced net filtration rate, uh, sorry, net filtration pressure and a reduced glomerular filtration rate. Now, conversely, when arterial blood pressure drops, so we have less blood coming in through our afferent arteriole, the smooth muscles in the walls of the afferent arteriole are stretched less, so they relax. They will then dilate, so this opening becomes wider. The renal blood flow will increase. It increases this glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, increases this net filtration pressure, and then increases our glomerular filtration rate. So the myogenic mechanism regulates our glomerular filtration rate by adjusting the blood flow into the glomerulus. This mechanism can work quite quickly and it can adjust our glomerular filtration rate within seconds after a change in blood pressure. Tubular glomerular feedback is the second method by which kidneys can regulate themselves or regulate that filtration rate themselves. This mechanism is called tubuloglomerular feedback because part of the renal tubules provide feedback to the glomerulus, which then subsequently alters its function. So in each nephron, the final part of the ascending limb of the nephron loop makes contact with the afferent arteriole serving that Bowman's capsule. So you'll see here, this is the ascending limb of the nephron loop. This is our afferent arteriole here, and they actually come into contact. The cells of the ascending limb that come into contact with the afferent arteriole are called our macula densa. So see these darker, slightly thinner cells here? These are our macula densa. 
alongside the macula densa in the walls of our afferent arterioles. And sometimes you'll also find them in the walls of the efferent arteriole are what we call our juxtaglomerular cells. So they're these kind of purple looking cells along here. And together, our juxtaglomerular cells and our macula densa cells form the juxtaglomerular apparatus. And so this is the apparatus which is responsible for tubular glomerular feedback. So how this method works is that when our glomerular filtration rate is elevated due to an increased blood pressure, so we have more blood coming in through to our glomerulus, it increases that glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. The filtrate flows more rapidly through our tubules. As a result, our proximal convoluted tubule and our nephron loop have less time to reabsorb sodium, reabsorb chloride, reabsorb water, all things that the body needs. The macula densa cells will actually detect that increased sodium, chloride and water in the filtrate that runs through that ascending limb of the nephron loop. And as a result, it inhibits the release of nitric oxide from cells in the juxtaglomerular apparatus, so from these cells here. Now, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So when we inhibit the release of nitric oxide, this afferent arteriole will constrict, meaning less blood comes into the glomerulus. We reduce that blood glomerular hydrostatic pressure and our uh, glomerular filtration rate will decrease. We also have this process working back the other way, so much like the myogenic mechanism, but it's not quite as effective going in the opposite direction. Also, compared to our myogenic mechanism, this tubular glomerular feedback works more slowly. So we actually have to have that increased blood pressure, making more filtrate to be formed so it goes through our tubules more quickly so that we can actually detect that change concentration of the filtrate in the macula denser cells here. Then we have that inhib inhibition of nitric oxide, the constriction of the afferent arteriole and that lowered blood pressure. So it's a much more slow mechanism compared to our myogenic mechanism. So putting all of that into a summary table for you that we will fill out as we go along. And the first method by which glomerular filtration rate is regulated was our renal autoregulation. And within the concept of renal autoregulation, which remember is the kidneys regulating themselves, is the myogenic mechanism and our tubular glomerular feedback. So starting with our myogenic mechanism, so the stimulus for our myogenic mechanism is stretching of the walls of the afferent arterioles due to an increase in systemic blood pressure. So we have an increase in blood pressure, more blood's trying to come into the glomerulus, it's stretching the walls of our afferent arteriole. In response, the smooth muscle in the walls of our afferent arteriole will constrict. They'll contract and reduce the diameter or the lumen of the afferent arteriole. Less blood can come into the glomerulus. It reduces that blood glomerular hydrostatic pressure and reduces that glomerular filtration rate. Our myogenic mechanism then is when we have our macula denser cells incre uh, detect the increased sodium and chloride in the renal tubules. That causes the inhibition of nitric oxide from our juxtaglomerular cells. That causes the afferent arteriole to constrict with less blood going into the glomerulus. Again, we have a lower glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which decreases our glomerular filtration rate. The next method by which glomerular filtration rate can be regulated is via the nervous system. So like most blood vessels of the body, those of the kidneys are supplied by the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system. This division of the nervous system is active during our fight or flight activities. When this division of the nervous system is stimulated, norepinephrine is released, which causes vasoconstriction of the smooth muscle in the afferent and the efferent arterioles. So at rest, 
input from the sympathetic division of the nervous system is quite low. And therefore, both the afferent and the efferent arterioles are dilated. And the body relies solely on that renal autoregulation to regulate our glomerular filtration rate. In moderate, moderately stressful situations where we have moderate input from the sympathetic nervous system, moderate amounts of norepinephrine are released and both the afferent and the efferent arterioles are constricted to the same degree. So they both get smaller and because a smaller amount of blood comes into the glomerulus and a smaller amount goes out, glomerular filtration rate is decreased but only to a small degree. We're reducing that promoting filtration pressure, the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, but we're also reducing that capsular pressure which opposes filtration. Now, in highly stressful situations, such as really intense exercise, if a person is bleeding and losing a lot of blood, if you're running away from some kind of accident, input from the sympathetic division of the nervous system is high, more epinephrine is released, and both the afferent and the efferent arterioles are again constricted, but to a much greater extent, the afferent arteriole. So because the afferent arteriole is so constricted, very little blood enters the glomerulus, that glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure is significantly reduced and then so therefore so is our glomerular filtration rate. This increasing degree of constriction of the afferent arteriole with increasing input from the sympathetic nervous system has two aims. Firstly, to reduce the amount of filtrate and therefore the less urine that is formed. So this helps conserve blood volume. It also helps redirect blood flow to other areas of the body, which are more important during stressful fight or flight situations. So it's important to filter our blood, but if we're running away from a tiger, not so important just in that moment. So putting that into our summary table, our next type of regulation is our neural regulation. This is a result of stimulation from the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system. When input from the sympathetic nervous system is high, we have a release of norepinephrine. This causes constriction of the afferent and to a lesser extent the efferent arterioles. This causes reduced blood flow to the glomerulus reduce glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure and therefore reduce glomerular filtration rate. The final method by which glomerular filtration rate is regulated is, is through the release of hormones. These hormones are angiotensin 2 and atrial natriuretic peptide. So both of these hormones we're going to talk about again in learning objective number two when we summarise the impact of hormones, or sorry, three I think it is, um, when we summarise the impact of hormones on renal physiology. But briefly, angiotensin 2 reduces a glomerular filtration rate while our atrial natriuretic peptide increases our glomerular filtration rate. So starting with angiotensin 2, and when blood volume and blood pressure decrease, the walls of the afferent arterioles are stretched less. The juxtaglomerular cells, which sit within, remember, the walls of the afferent arteriole, secrete an enzyme called renin. This goes into the blood and it results in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system being activated. As part of this system, the hormone angiotensin 2 is produced. And as a potent vasoconstrictor, both the afferent and the efferent arterioles are constricted and narrowed. And as we now know, this reduces blood flow into the glomerulus, reduces that glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, and reduces our glomerular filtration rate. Atrial natriuretic peptide, also called ANP, is secreted by cells in the atria of the heart and it's released in response to an increase in blood volume, which causes stretching of cells in the atria. ANP works by causing relaxation of mesangeal cells in the glomerulus. So these are smooth muscle-like cells, which increase the surface area available for filtration. 
So when there's more surface area, we can filter through more blood, more of that blood plasma goes into the renal tubules and we have an increase in our glomerular filtration rate. The more blood that is filtered, the more blood that is excreted as urine, this reduces our blood volume and therefore reduces that original stimulus. So again, recapping that information for you in the table, we have our hormonal regulation, we have angiotensin 2, it's released in response to a drop in blood pressure, it causes vasoconstriction of the afferent and the efferent arterial, we have reduced blood flow into the glomerulus that reduce glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure and our reduced glomerular filtration rate. We have atrial natriuretic peptide. It's released when we have stretching of the cells in our atria because of an increase in blood volume. It relaxes mesangeal cells in the glomerulus. So that kind of opens up all the pores and the holes within that filtration membrane. So we have an increase in filtration. If more filtration is occurring, it increases that filtration rate. The next step in your information is then tubular reabsorption and secretion. So learning objective is to be able to describe these two processes. And just before you freak out, these processes are much, much more straightforward. So beginning with tubular reabsorption, and remember tubular reabsorption is when the water and solutes in the filtrate are being reabsorbed back into the blood in the peritubular capillaries and the vasorecta. So we've had the substances filtered out of the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule. It's gone into our tubules and now we're taking it out of the tubules and putting it back into our blood. So it's the stuff that we want, that we need within our body, and then we don't want excreted as urine. So a lot of reabsorption occurs along the renal tubules and the collecting duct because remember with our, our glomerular filtration, basically everything except for blood cells and large proteins are filtered out of the blood and into the Bowman's capsule. So if we continued like this, and if we didn't have lots of reabsorption going on, then our bodies would very, very quickly run out of water and run out of nutrients, and we would just be urinating all the time. So epithelial cells along the renal tubules and the collecting duct carry out reabsorption. But by far the largest contributor to reabsorption is the proximal convoluted tubule. So just after that filtrate exits the Bowman's capsule. So it's like we filter it all out and then really quickly we want to grab everything and put it back in the blood. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, about 99% of the water that is filtered out will be reabsorbed. And then solutes that are reabsorbed via both active, so requiring energy, or passive transport, which doesn't require energy and is stuff like diffusion, includes glucose, amino acids, urea, and then ions like sodium, potassium, calcium, chloride, phosphate, and bicarbonate. So it's stuff that our body needs and uses. Once the filtrate passes through the proximal convoluted tubule, our cells located more distally, so in our uh, distal convoluted tubule and our collecting duct, they more fine tune the reabsorption process. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, we kind of grab everything we need. In the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, we kind of take an account of the body and where it's sitting, what does it need? Are we dehydrated? Do we need more sodium? And then it kind of fine tunes the reabsorption based on that, that assessment. Now, to appreciate the magnitude of tubular reabsorption, approximately 180 litres of water enters the Bowman's capsule after moving through the filtration membrane each day. 178 to 100 and, um, sorry, 178 to 179 litres are reabsorbed back into the peritubular capillaries and the vasorector. And we usually only excrete about one to two litres as urine. So lots and lots of reabsorption going on. Tubular secretion is then the opposite of reabsorption. 
So it's taking any waste products or any excess ions that have made their way back into the blood and put them into the filtrate to be excreted. So taking it from the blood here, putting it into the filtrate, into the renal tubules, remembering anything that stays in those renal tubules is going to be excreted as urine. What we secrete is the stuff that the body no longer needs or no longer wants. So tubular secretion occurs all the way along the renal tubules and substances that may be secreted include things like hydrogen and potassium ions, as well as any drugs that we've taken. Tubular secretion funks, functions not only to eliminate any waste products and drugs from our body in urine, but it also helps regulate our blood pH by adjusting the secretion of hydrogen ions. Now, in no way am I expecting you to remember the numbers and the substances in this image, but I just think it's a really nice summary of tubular reabsorption and secretion and how our proximal convoluted tubule, just as the filtrate comes out of the Bowman's capsule, um, goes more or undergoes more kind of routine reabsorption and secretion. So getting anything we always need, secreting anything we're never going to want, but then our distal convoluted tubule and our collecting duct is responsible for more of that fine tuning of the composition of the bodily fluids, which depends on the body's needs at any given time. So walking you through this figure, we have our glomerular filtration happening up in our renal corpuscle. We then have the substances that are reabsorbed and secreted in the proximal convoluted tubule. So we reabsorb about 65% of the water via osmosis 65% of our sodium and our potassium. All of the glucose we'll try and take out of our uh, filtrate and put back into our blood. All of our amino acids. 50% of our chloride. 80 to 90% of our bicarbonate. 50% of our urea. And then variable amounts of calcium and magnesium, depending on how the body's going. Do we need more calcium if we've got enough? We then secrete variable amounts of hydrogen. This is dependent on our blood pH and then some other waste products down here. In the nephron loop, we have reabsorption of water, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, and then those variable substances down here again. So our calcium and our magnesium. We also secrete urea. And then in our early distal convoluted tubule and our late distal convoluted tubule and our collecting duct, we mostly have variable amounts of substances being reabsorbed and secreted based on whether we need more, let's say calcium, we need more magnesium, we need to secrete more hydrogen. This part of the tubule is also where our antidiuretic hormone and our aldosterone will work. And so this will adjust how much sodium and chloride and water we are reabsorbing. But moving on to learning objective number three, and related to some of the processes we just discussed, uh, we just covered. This is to describe the production of dilute and concentrated urine. So a little bit of background on urine to begin with, and in people with healthy, normally functioning kidneys, approximately one to two liters of urine are produced per day. The amount of urine produced will be affected by things like fluid intake. So how hydrated someone is, uh, what their blood pressure is doing and glomerular filtration rate, their diet, particularly things like how much sodium you are consuming, body temperature, diuretics, and also just general health. Typically, urine is made up of about 95% water and 5% solutes, with some of the solutes that we excrete being electrolytes, waste products derived from cellular metabolism, as well as any exogenous substances. So these are things like drugs, which are actually, um, they don't originate from within, within the body. So they originate from an external source. Now, the volume and composition of urine will vary so that the total volume of fluid within our body remains relatively stable. So the fluid within our body doesn't change. But whether we excrete more or less urine 
will change to keep the fluid balance in our body stable. So in a person who is well hydrated, whose kidneys are functioning normally, a large volume of dilute urine will be produced. So dilute means that there's a higher percentage of water and a lower percentage of solutes. So you have dilute urine. When you go to the bathroom, you urinate quite a lot and that urine is quite pale or almost clear. In a person who is dehydrated, they will produce a small volume of concentrated urine. So with concentrated urine, there is a lower percentage of water and a higher percentage of solutes. This is when you go to the bathroom and your urine is really that dark yellow colour and often quite smelly. Now the hormone antidiuretic hormone or ADH controls whether dilute or concentrated urine is formed. In the absence of ADH, urine is dilute. When ADH is present, more water is reabsorbed into the blood and so a smaller volume of concentrated urine will be formed. So looking at the process of producing dilute urine, and remember we produce a large volume of dilute urine when we're well hydrated. And so the first step of urine formation, as we've discussed, is glomerular filtration. So we have blood coming in through that afferent arteriole, being filtered through the glomerulus through that filtration membrane, and the filtrate enters the Bowman's capsule. The osmolarity of the filtrate, which is like the concentration of the filtrate, at this stage is very similar to blood. So it's about 300 milliosmoles per litre, and that's what this 300 represents here, the concentration of the filtrate. As the filtrate moves through the proximal convoluted tubule, the osmolarity stays about the same. As the filtrate moves down the descending limb of the nephron loop, the osmolarity increases, so it becomes more concentrated. As it moves up the ascending limb, it becomes less concentrated. So you can see that number going down. Through the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct, when there is no ADH present, the permeability of these cells to water is quite low. So water remains in the tubules while solutes can be reabsorbed. So solutes are coming out, but that water remains in here. So we end up with a large volume of quite dilute urine. When water intake is low or our water loss is high, so it could be really heavy sweating or it could be that you've lost a lot of blood, the kidneys must conserve water while still eliminating wastes and excess ions. So we want to hold on to the water, but we actually still need to urinate so we can get rid of the, the, the bad things in our body. So under the influence of antidiuretic hormone, the kidneys produce a small volume of concentrated urine. There are two things that help us produce concentrated urine. They are the long nephron loops in the juxtamandullary nephrons, which remember dip really deep down into the concentrated uh, interstitial fluid of the renal medulla and then, then also the presence of antidiuretic hormone. So the first thing I want to point out in this image is you'll see how this blue of the interstitial fluid of the renal medulla gets darker the deeper it goes down into the kidney. What this is trying to represent is the osmolarity or the concentration of the interstitial fluid and the deeper you go down into that renal medulla, the more concentrated that interstitial fluid. The solutes which contribute to this osmolarity are largely sodium, chloride, and urea. Now, there are two factors which build and then maintain this osmotic gradient or that, that in more increasingly concentrated uh, interstitial fluid in the renal medulla. These are the differences in solute and water permeability in the different sections of the nephron loop. And then the countercurrent flow of filtrate and blood through the nephron loops and through the vasorector. So countercurrent flow, 
simply refers to the flow of fluid in opposite directions. So for example, here we have fluid filtrate going down here and then filtrate going up. So it's going in opposite directions. Same with our vasorecta, we have blood going down and then blood going up. So counter current flow. Now there are two types of counter current mechanisms that exist in the kidneys. These are counter current multiplication and counter current exchange. So counter current multiplication is the process by which the interstitial fluid of the renal medulla becomes increasingly more concentrated. So counter current multiplication uh, involves these two steps here. So first, we have sodium and chloride actively pumped out of the filtrate in this thick portion of the ascending limb of the nephron loop. So it's actively using energy being pumped out into this interstitial fluid. Because this part of the nephron loop is impermeable to water, water gets stuck within the tubules and we have a buildup of sodium and chloride within the interstitial fluid. In response to the increased osmolarity or the increased uh, concentration of this interstitial fluid, water in our descending limb of the nephron loop, which is permeable to water, then moves out of the tubules to kind of equalize that concentration of the fluids. This increases the osmolarity of the filtrate left behind. So we have sodium and chloride being actively pumped out here into the interstitial fluid. To balance that out, we have water passively diffusing via osmosis out into that interstitial fluid. Now, as filtrate is constantly being formed up here in our Bowman's capsule, we constantly have filtrate moving through these tubules. Solutes are constantly being reabsorbed or actively pumped out into the interstitial fluid, and we constantly have water moving into the, inter into, into the interstitial fluid here. Now, more solutes are pumped down here, deeper in the renal, renal medulla into the interstitial fluid because we have a higher concentration of the sodium and the chloride deeper along that nephron loop. Similarly here, we have more water being reabsorbed at the top of that descending limb going back out into the interstitial fluid because there's more water here in that tubule compared to here. So that's why we have a slightly lesser concentration of that interstitial fluid and it gets more and more and more concentrated the deeper we go down. We then have our counter current exchange. And this is the process by which solutes and water are passively exchanged between the blood in the vasorector and the interstitial fluid of the renal medulla. So we have blood entering the descending limb of the vasorector. So this is the, the capillaries, if you have a look up here, the capillaries that are straight and they run parallel to our nephron loop. The blood entering this descending limb of the vasorector has an osmolarity of about 300 milliosmoles per litre, which is about the same as the filtrate. As it flows down deeper into the vasorector, where this interstitial fluid is becoming increasingly more concentrated, the sodium chloride and the urea from the interstitial fluid diffuses back into the blood. Similarly, the water from inside the blood inside that vasorector diffuses out into the interstitial fluid. As the blood then moves up the ascending limb of that vasorector, we have the sodium chloride going from the blood in the vasorector back out into the interstitial fluid. And then we have water going from the interstitial fluid back into the blood. What the net result of this is that the blood leaving the vasorector has only a slightly higher osmolarity of the blood entering the vasorector. So although lots is going on, these two actions of the two different sides of the vasorector kind of cancel each other out. What this allows is for the vasorector to actually provide oxygen and nutrients to the tissue of the renal medulla, 
without washing out or diminishing this osmotic gradient, which is really important for concentrated urine and which we'll talk about next. So the nephron loop estabul uh, can't talk today, establishes the osmotic gradient by pumping out the sodium here and then having water move out via osmosis here. But our vasorector maintain that gradient by the countercurrent exchange. So the filtrate has now moved from the Bowman's capsule through the prox proximal convoluted tubule down and then up our nephron loop and we now reach the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. When antidiuretic hormone is released and it's circulating in our blood, it acts on the principal cells of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct and it makes these cells more permeable to water. Water then moves out of the filtrate into the concentrated renal medulla and then back into the blood. So because it's more concentrated outside of the renal tubules or the collecting duct, the, the water will move from the collecting duct through those really permeable principal cells into the interstitial fluid, which then ends up back into the blood. With this loss of water from the filtrate within the tubules, we now have a smaller volume of highly concentrated urine. So with no ADH present, we produce large volumes of dilute urine, mostly in our cortical nephrons. In the presence of antidiuretic hormone, we produce a small volume of concentrated urine in our juxtamedullary nephrons, so our nephrons with these big, long nephron loops. We can produce the concentrated urine thanks to this osmotic gradient, which makes it more concentrated in this interstitial fluid so that the water actually wants to leave the renal tubules and go through back into the blood. And this is a result of that countercurrent multiplication, which actually establishes this osmotic gradient. And then the countercurrent exchange, which maintains this osmotic gradient. Now, Having just talked about one hormone, we're going to move on to some more. So learning objective number four to describe or summarize the impact of hormones on renal physiology. So the first hormone we're going to look at is angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 is produced as part of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. When blood volume and blood pressure decrease, this system is activated. The walls of the afferent arterioles are stretched less. And the juxtaglomerular cells secrete the enzyme renin into the blood. Renin breaks down angiotensinogen, which is a protein which is produced by the liver and it's found circulating in the blood, into angiotensin 1. We then have angiotensin converting enzyme, which breaks down angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, which is the active form of the hormone. Now that entire process, I'm going to show to you again on the next slide. So don't feel like you have to stop and write all that down. So angiotensin 2 affects renal physiology in three main ways. It decreases glomerular filtration rate by causing vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles. It enhances reabsorption of sodium and water in the proximal convoluted tubule. So if we reabsorb more sodium, water will follow it to balance out that osmolarity. And then it also stimulates the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. And so we'll talk about aldosterone in a second. So giving you a summary, summary of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, this system is stimulated because of a drop in blood pressure. Typically, that's because of a decrease in blood volume. So it could be that we're dehydrated, we have insufficient sodium, so we're not reabsorbing enough water, or we've lost a lot of blood, like if we're hemorrhaging. This decrease in blood pressure stretches the walls of the afferent arterioles less, and the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys release renin. Renin is an enzyme, and it breaks down angiotensinogen, which has come from the liver, into angiotensin 1. 
Angiotensin 1 is still an inactive form of a hormone. So it goes to the lungs where we secrete angiotensin converting enzyme. And that breaks down angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2, remember, works in those three ways. It has vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles. It causes the release of aldosterone, which subsequently increases sodium and water reabsorption. And it also independently increases sodium and water reabsorption in the proximal convoluted tubule. All of those three actions act to either increase blood volume or directly increase blood pressure. Now, I don't expect you to be able to draw out a figure like this. I simply want you to know that the renin angiotensin system is stimulated because of a drop in blood volume and blood pressure. To have these effects over here, we need to get the hormone into the active form, which is angiotensin 2. And then angiotensin 2 has those three effects. So aldosterone, we've mentioned not only just in this lecture, but a few times already this semester. And it's released by the adrenal cortex in response to a drop in blood pressure because it also makes up part of that renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. As we've mentioned, aldosterone works to stimulate the principal cells in the collecting ducts to reabsorb more sodium and secrete more potassium. When there's more sodium in the blood, we have increased reabsorption of water, which increases our blood volume and increases our blood pressure. Now, aldosterone works along the late distal convoluted tubule and along the collecting duct. Next, we have antidiuretic hormone or ADH. You may also read this hormone called vasopressin. So this hormone regulates water reabsorption by increasing the permeability of principal cells in the last part of the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct to water. So in the absence of ADH, when there's no ADH, the membranes of the principal cells have a very low permeability to water. So this means water can't move through them. However, within these cells are little vesicles that contain lots and lots of copies of a water channel protein called aquaporin 2. ADH stimulates the insertion of this aquaporin 2 into the membranes of these cells, which subsequently allows water to move more easily through them. So ADH is released when the osmolarity or the concentration of the blood increases. So this can be, um, or this is usually when we have a lack of water in the blood, like with dehydration. ADH can also be released when we have a drop in blood volume, such as really severe dehydration or severe blood loss. So just looking quickly at how ADH works. So these are our principal cells here. When we have no ADH present, these aquaporins, which are the little pink dots, sit within vesicles inside the cell. If these aquaporins aren't on the membrane of the cell, no water can move through. So any water stuck in the renal tubules can't move through these principal cells back into the water. When we have antidiuretic hormone present, it stimulates the movement of these proteins into the cell membranes. Water can now move through those proteins and back into the blood. We then have atrial natriuretic pep uh, peptide, which works in the opposite direction to antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. So the release of ANP from the heart is stimulated by an increase in blood volume, which stretches the atria. ANP works to inhibit the reabsorption of sodium and water in the proximal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. With less sodium in the blood, there's less water that will follow it. Our blood volume is less and this reduces our blood pressure. This will stop the stretching of the atria and that initial stimulus is reduced. AMP can also work to inhibit the release of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. 
So those two hormones which oppose the action of ANP. Lastly, we have parathyroid hormone. So this is another hormone we've mentioned a few times this semester. This is not a hormone that is related to blood volume or blood pressure like the rest that we've talked about today, but rather the concentration of ions within the blood. So the release of parathyroid hormone is stimulated by a drop in the concentration of calcium in the blood, which in turn stimulates cells in the early distal convoluted tubule to reabsorb more calcium in the blood to bring that concentration back up. So hopefully by now we have a reasonable understanding of each of these hormones, what triggers their release, how they affect functioning of the kidneys, and I guess the kind of end result. But just as a bit of extra revision, I've put this summary table here for you with all of this information on one slide. I don't necessarily want you to know every single word in this table, but I do recommend having a go at creating your own summary table. So the name of the hormone, what triggers its release, how it works, and what its neck effect is. So for example, if you have increased sodium and water reabsorption, that this increases blood volume and therefore blood pressure. And then the last learning objective for the physiology of the urinary system is to describe the storage and elimination of urine. So once the filtrate leaves our collecting ducts, it drains into our major, uh, sorry, our minor calyces and then our major calyces and it's now called urine. From the major calyces, they unite to form the renal pelvis. From the renal pelvis, the urine drains into our ureters and then the urinary bladder. Urine is then temporarily stored in the bladder until it's discharged through a single urethra. Discharge of urine from the urinary bladder is called micturition, but you may also see it termed as urination or as voiding the bladder. And somewhat like defecation, micturition occurs via a combination of involuntary and voluntary muscle contractions. So as we have urine coming down our ureters and filling up our urinary bladder, once we exceed between 200 and 400 millimetres, uh, sorry, milliliters, pressure within the bladder will increase. It will stimulate stretch receptors in the wall of the bladder. And this stimulates a nerve impulse to the micturition centre, which is in the, uh, the sacral spinal cord. This initiates a reflex arc where we have parasympathetic motor impulses cause contraction of the detrusor muscle. So this is the muscle that surrounds the entire bladder. We also have relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. So our internal urethral sphincter, remember, is made up of smooth muscle. So it's involuntary. We don't have voluntary control over this internal sphincter. At the same time, if the timing and the situation allows, we have motor neurons that innervate our external urethral sphincter causing the sphincter to be inhibited so that it relaxes and urination can take place. Remember, our external urethral sphincter is made up of skeletal muscle, so we do have control over it. As the bladder fills, it causes a sensation of fullness that initiates that kind of, for lack of a better term, desire to go to the bathroom or urinate before this reflex actually occurs. So we get warning that this reflex is going to take place. And although emptying of the bladder is a reflex, in early childhood, we learn to initiate it and to stop it voluntarily. So we can go to the toilet when we don't necessarily need to, and we can also delay it for a small period of time. Now, putting all of that into a bit of a text summary for you, so when urine in the bladder exceeds 200 to 400 milliliters, we have stretch receptors that transmit nerve impulses to the sacral spinal cord. It goes up to the micturition center. That initiates a reflex arc, which causes contraction of the detrusor muscle, the muscle that surrounds the bladder and will actually help expel it from the body, as well as the relaxation, <coughs> excuse me, the relaxation of our internal urethral sphincter. 
when the timing and place is right, like we've actually made it to the bathroom, we then have conscious relaxation of our external urethral sphincter, which is made up of skeletal muscle, and this allows urination to occur. Now that is all for the physiology of the urinary system. I appreciate it. It is a lot. Thank you for listening and see you all in the lab for a bit of a recap.